Okay, so chapter 15 is about fresh water, and it deals um, with things like littoral and um, uh, the limnetic zones, all those weird words that you had to learn. Um, I gave you a lot of tips for those if you'll watch the video for chapter 15. I have like a funny story, and then you'll that total thing will make a lot of sense to you. Um, but chapter 16 is more about the ocean, so we're going to be talking about some of the issues going on there. Um, marine pollution is a big thing, um, and then also over-harvesting of fish. And so what ended up happening, um, if you've ever had cod, like North Atlantic cod, that was a big, big, big um, industry um, off the coast of New England and off the coast of Canada. And so there were two big fishing grounds, George's Bank and Grand, Bank, uh, Grand Banks. And so they were very lucrative, that means profitable, um, for catching cod. And cod are what's called ground fish. That means that they um, live on the bottom of the ocean. Uh, benthic fish, uh, benthic means bottom. And so they are fish for centuries. Um, cod eat small fish and invertebrates. They actually live on both sides of the Atlantic. So if you were to go uh, to the North Atlantic on the Europe side, they would be there as well. There's North Pacific cod. And so we've actually over harvested all the North Atlantic cod. And so I saw this, it was so funny, like on a billboard from Wendy's, it was like North Pacific cod. And I, I was like, well, at least it's wild caught. But then at the same time, like, I knew that that was North Pacific cod because we had already harvested all the North Atlantic cod and killed them. So, um, it was like, man, that stinks. So anyway, um, cod populations really shrank in the 80s and 90s. And um, a lot of that, if you, you guys remember IPAT, right? Pat your eye um, for impact. Um, so impact is population times affluence times technology. And so when we increase our technology as far as like fish finding capabilities, increase nets and stuff, we we're able to like get all the fish. Um, so anyway, it was temporarily banned. Unfortunately, it was a huge uh, part of the economy, like I had said. A lot of people lost their jobs, and the the stocks of cod, the, the schools of cod, the, the fish there, they never did come back. Because what had happened was, you guys remember, you know, if we talk about um, here's our, our growth, and you want to harvest at half the carrying capacity, they harvested all the way down here. And so you had no large fish left that were strong enough to, and old enough to reproduce. And so never really able to get those populations back. And just, um, they're just now starting to uh, kind of rebound. And there's just a complete moratorium, which is closure of the area. And so if we look here, you can see uh, where the fishing grounds used to be, the Grand Banks. And um, all these places were just closed to fishing in 1994. Here, this place was closed in 1992. Um, and so that's really unfortunate. Um, it was profitable for a while, but then you do end up um, over-exploiting a resource and you don't have it anymore. So anyway, um, there's just a few, there's, well, there's a lot of numbers. You just have to have memorized for the AP exam. Um, one of those numbers, uh, or two of those numbers, I should say, yeah, here we have oceans cover about 71% of the Earth's surface. So 70% of the Earth is covered in, in, in ocean, basically. And, um, and the oceans contain about 97.5% of all the water on Earth. And they're just one single vast body of water. Um, some people will just refer to it as a global ocean instead of four or five major oceans. Um, it's all connected. So um, they're going to moderate the climate. We had talked a lot when we talked about um, cities, how water is really hard to heat and cool. And so um, if you were to live on the coast, it keeps your temperature pretty constant. That's why it's so beautiful in Southern California. Like no matter what time of the year you go, it's nice, breezy, warm, 72. That's why everybody wants to live in L.A. It's great. Um, sign me up. This is crazy. Um, so I want to talk to you guys a little bit about... Um, the ocean and the ocean floor. I'm going to box this off a little bit. Um, the, lot, the way I like to think about the ocean, uh, if we were to go out to the parking lot and you are going to get on your bus, right? Like if you're standing on the sidewalk, you know how you can't stand off the sidewalk or you get shot when you hit the pa pavement? Have you seen that? Have you tried to get on a bus at the school? Not really shot, but you know what I'm talking about. Like you have to stay up on the sidewalk. You can't be the one to go off and then like everybody pushes each other when they're freshmen. Have you seen this before? <laughs> Do you know what I'm talking about? So anyway, if we're all sitting on the sidewalk, it's kind of uplifted here, and then there's a drop-off. So this uplifted 
thick part here. This is my continental crust. Remember, the continental crust is really thick. And so uh, as it transitions to oceanic crust, which is pretty thin, there's a drop-off there. And that drop-off is called the con if I kind of draw it in. That's called the continental slope. And so that makes sense because it's really sloped. This flat part here, this is the continental shelf. And so when we're fishing or cod, you got to fish on the continental shelf because otherwise you're going to be fishing two foot, oh, not two foot, two, two miles deep for fish. Have you ever watched those crab fishing shows in Alaska? Yes. And like they're trying to get the crabs at, on the continental shelf, and the continental shelf is real close to the surface there uh, where Alaska and Kyle Russia meet together. But that's all continental crust, and so that's how they can crab fish there. Um, otherwise, they would have to have two miles of chain on that basket, right? And so um, this that shelf that we're fishing on, at least ground fish, and crab are ground fish. They're benthic. Benthic means bottom. They live on the bottom of the ocean. So anyway, um, and then here, this real flat part, this is called my abyssal plain. Splat goes on forever. And then, if you guys recall from us studying plate tectonics, here's my magma, right? And so, this is where the magma comes out, right here. And then I have that um, mid ocean ridge, I have a rift valley in the mid ocean ridge. And if I continue talking about plate tectonics, this is a subduction zone, and there's my nice deep trench. Those trenches are what causes uh, earthquakes and cause tsunamis as that plate is trying to go down, gets stuck, and that overriding plate pops up, moves the water, get a tsunami. That's our overview of plate tectonics. Is that ringing some bells for you? Yes, ma'am. What's the name of that plane? Oh, the abyssal plane. How do you spell that? Uh, a B Y S S A L. Abyssal. Oh, so, I get it. Yeah, and so. Okay. This is my uh, divergent plate boundary, this is my convergent plate boundary, and this is all volcanic island art. This would be analogous to a situation like um, Japan or Indonesia. Okay, so going back to all the things that we have learned, um, kind of ties back into the ocean. So anyway, the continental shelf, those are those um, areas of shallow uh, sea floor next to the continents, so that's where we're going to fish. Um, the, the break there where it drops off, it would be like the edge of the sidewalk, is the sh sh that should say shelf, shelf slope break, um, and then the slope is the actual drop off. And so um, I took a class in college on oceanography, and we had to learn like all these crazy names. Like we could talk about this for, you know, five months, which would be, it was really interesting. I love the class, but that ain't that much on the AP exam. So a second ago, you got to keep all these numbers straight. A second ago, I told you that about 70% of the earth is covered in water, or, or oceans, really. And then all the water in the ocean, think of about 97.5% of the water on earth. You feel okay about that? So keep that separate. Now, if I have a drop of ocean water, if I have a single drop of ocean water, if I do the percentages of that, 96.5% of, uh, of that is actually water. About 3.5% of the water in the ocean is made of salt. So anyway, um, where the salts come from, if you think about it, uh, chlorine is not very uh, needed for life, and neither is sodium. Right? The sodium, if you have too much sodium, your blood pressure goes up. Those are things that you excrete out when you urinate, for example, or sweat, because um, they're in too high doses, they're toxic to your body. And so if you think about the salt in the ocean being sodium and chlorine, or chloride ions, there's a reason for that. Those are the ions that no life needs. And so after uh, rocks weather, things like phosphate, nitrate gets taken up by plants, things like calcium carbonate make seashells, what you have left, the sodium and the chlorine or chloride, nobody really needs that. That's why the, that's why the ocean is salty. It's very interesting to me. So anyway, the salt's left behind, and you guys know that when water evaporates to make rain, for example, you know, the, the salt doesn't go anywhere. Um, oceans also contain low levels of nutrients, nitrogen and phosphorus. So these are the things that are going to come across, and um, if they're in too high content, they can cause algae blooms. And I saw a story about a, a bay in uh, Florida where they had had a, a brown tide, which is an algae bloom, and it, like, the whole area was just covered in dead fish. And it was, did you guys see that last week? Did you watch the news? No. 
I'll pull it up. And so there was like this beautiful bay in uh, Florida and, you know, uh, and there was brown tide and then just the whole bay was just covered in dead fish floating to the top. So anyway. All right. So um, oxygen is also in the water. It's added by plants as they do uh, photosynthesis. Um, and then also just goes into the uh, ocean from just the atmosphere. Those things can dissolve, dissolve into the water from atmosphere. Um, carbon dioxide is also um, present in the ocean uh, because <clears throat> it can dissolve into the water as well. So anyway, if I'm looking at a drop of ocean water, um, I told you guys that you know most of the salt, when we think of salt water, it is, it is the salt that you have in table salt. It is, back up, let me just <laughs> Okay. Look at me. Let's just like make the world make sense. Y'all know that when you get some, I feel like I have some salt in here. I feel like I found it. Excuse me. Do you understand that when your mama buys salt with the lady with the umbrella on it, you know what I'm talking about? Um, that salt. Oh, pepper just fell out. Pepper is unrelated to this conversation. Um, that's something different. But um. The struggle is real. Got it? Okay. Uh, when your mom buys salt, what that salt is, that salt is actually mined out from a dried up seabed. So when I say the salt in the ocean is the salt that you eat, the salt that you eat was actually the salt in the ocean. Did you know that? That's where salt comes from. Dried up, like, yeah, one person's mm -hmm. taking it. It's, so it's not like magic fairies don't make this. This comes up from dried seabed. So anyway, um, a lot of those are like underground, uh, yes, ancient seabeds. How common do you think those um, like salt plains are? Um, like, are, are uh, some of the salt mines are actually underground. Like, do you um, think we're at risk of running out? Like, no, because uh, especially as we go through droughts and desertification, I mean, the water is always evaporating. And a lot of places in the Middle East actually have to do desalination to get fresh water and there's oh, salt so left there's behind. Yeah, salt. there's. I don't think we're going to run out of salt. I think we're good. Yes, ma'am? Uh, you know how there's like sea salt in the so the iodine or the iodide ions that are added to it, that uh, prevents you from getting borders, which was, um, I'm pointing to the right part of my body. Um, there, uh, the swelling of your, I guess it's just, is it just lymph nodes? Yeah. But yeah, and so the iodine in there prevents that. So um, that's the issue. So we purposely add um, iodide ions into the salt. So we have some sodium iodide in place of the sodium chloride. And so that just, it's, um, it just helps you not to, to have problems with that. So anyway, uh, sodium chlorine, uh, those are the two most abundant elements. Sulfates after it. And if you look at what's left, if you look at, the, you know, the other micronutrients in the water, you know, you don't see nitrate, you don't see phosphate because those are so in demand for life. A um, little bit of calcium there, magnesium's there. And like I said, these are things that... Um, you need to make seashells. You need calcium to make seashells. You need uh, you need uh, carbonate to make seashells. Um, so anyway, the the nitrogen and the phosphorus they're they're pretty low in uh, low in supply. So that's why you get those um, those algae blooms. So anyway, um, water um, as you go down, y'all been to I know y'all been to Lake Altoona and went swimming. You know you get swimming up at the surface, you're just floating around, whatever. It's pretty nice and warm. But if you, like, let your feet go down a little bit, it gets cold. I mean, have you been swimming in, like, a real body of water, and at the surface it's nice, and then it gets really cold? Well, the ocean is the same way, but just really amplified. And so um, water is going to get colder with depth. And not only is it going to get colder with depth, it's going to get saltier with depth. And so because um, salt water is uh, more dense than fresh water. And so the salt water is going to sink down. And so you have this really clear defining boundary between the surface water and this deep water. And it doesn't mix because the surface water is a little bit fresher as far as less salt. And it's also um, going to be warmer. And so then you have this pink decline. And that's the zone below the surface. And this is the area where um, density is going to and, you know, increase really rapidly. Is there a specific term, like I've seen um, in documentaries about uh, really deep um, seasons where it almost looks like there's a lake? Oh, like little pockets of things? Yeah, that's, 
that happens. And it depends on the area. But that's really specific to each place. So, um, anyway, the pink decline is where, you know, your density is going to decrease, uh, excuse me, increase really rapidly. Um, and so, here's the thing. On the test, um, there's a graph, and it's not in the PowerPoint. You don't even... You don't need, if you can read a graph, you don't even need me to explain it to you. But the issue is, no matter where you are around the world, so if I take this globe and I, and I go to the equator, right? The water there at the surface is going to be, it's going to be, it's going to be relatively fresh because um, it rains at the equator every day. So here I am at the equator. The surface water is going to be really fresh and warm, so that's nice. Now, if I go down below the pink decline, it's going to be super cold, super soft. If I go all the way up here to the coast of Alaska, and I go all the way past the pink decline to the deep water, that deep water in Alaska is the same as the deep water in uh, somewhere off the coastline at the equator. And once you pass the, the surface zone, the surface zone in Alaska would be much colder. Um, but if I go down to the deep water, it's all the same around the world. And so that is... Um, that's something to remember. That surface water varies, but below that pink decline, there it's not all the same. So, uh, um, do uh, are there separate currents for the pink decline? And um, so the like, there is the that's the her, th thermohaline cycle circulation. And I'm I'm gonna get to that in just a second. So anyway, um, that deep zone that's what I was talking about. About eighty percent of the ocean water is there. It's not affected by winds. It doesn't get any sunlight. The temperature is all the same. And so it's it's um going to be pretty um pretty stable there around the world. Now if we talk about water anywhere. Water is the temperature of water is going to stay pretty constant. And so like I said, it helps to moderate the um, climate. Water has a high heat capacity, which in your terms means I want to try to make spaghetti. Like I, you know as well as I do, you can get some ground beef out. You have that stuff all brown and gray, got the spaghetti sauce done. That water ain't even boiling yet. Like, correct me when I'm wrong. That sucks, right? So the reason it's really hard to heat and cool water because water hydrogen bonds. <laughs> me and Jada, water. <laughs> um, but anyway, water is is basically kind of stuck to itself. Um, the the oxygen side of it. I'll draw you. I'll draw you some water. Oh, I will do that for you. Um, let me add a slide. Um, so if I draw some water, doo -doo -doo, la -la -la. Doo -doo -doo. these are oxygens. Doo -doo 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 -doo. So I like chemistry. Did you know that? I don't know. That one's not quite in the zone. But what ends up happening is water will kind of stick to itself. Do, do, do. That one's. And these are little hydrogen bonds. I think that's the best thing I ever drew. Um, and so they're not, each water molecule isn't like truly bonded to each other, but the, the oxygen side, if y'all remember chemistry, you remember how oxygen is a two minus charge? It's a little, it's electronegative, and hydrogen is like a plus, remember? And so the Mickey Mouse chin is a little bit negative, and the Mickey Mouse ears are a little bit positive, and so water gets stuck to itself. That's why it hurts like crap when you belly flop, because water's stuck to itself, and you have to actually break apart those little hydrogen bonds, that little black dot, the hydrogen bonds. Um, also, why it's hard to pull water, um, yeah. And why, like, some little animals can scoot across the water like this, or water striders. It's not magic. They're just being um, held up by these hydrogen bonds. So do you think water would boil faster if you added soap? Soap? Yeah. Since it would act from an emulsifier. Um, so it, water helps break the surface tension, but the definition of boiling is where the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, so it would not change the vapor pressure of water. It doesn't do anything to break the hydrogen bonds. Um, as, unless at the surface. I don't think it would boil faster. As That would be interesting to test. Boil slower when you add salt. I know that. I can go into that. I can spend an hour on that. That's true. Um, so anyway, um, oceans are going to help regulate the climate. They're going to absorb and release heat. And the surface is going to move that heat around. And so you know the surface moves the heat around. Um, and we can see that when we go to the beach and it's nice and warm. Uh, or has anybody ever been to the beach in California? It looks beautiful. And you're like, I'm going to go swimming. Oh, no, you're not. Oh, no, you're not going to go swimming. Because that is the, there's the Alaskan current. That's actually the name of it. The Alaskan current comes down from Alaska and brings cold water. And in Florida, we have 
currents from the Caribbean, and that's why the water's not so warm in Florida. But you go to Alaska, oh, it's July, feeling good about it, get in that water about three seconds, you said, nope, um, take a wetsuit. So the, the currents do move stuff around. I was going to talk about currents. There they are. Um, so I'll kind of zoom in on these. I'll show you. So you can see in Alaska, <laughs> there, off the coast of Alaska, the current comes down. There it goes. See, it comes down to California. And then we have this water from the Caribbean coming to um, Florida. And so that's the difference. Usually on the west side of continents, you're going to get cold polar water. See? Cold. West side of continents, cold. And then where's the west side of this? Dee -dee 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 -dee. See? See? And then the east side's going to be warm. I learned that in oceanography. There's a lot to that. Um, but basically, when you go to study this, it makes these little circles. Can you all see the circles okay? There's a circle. There's a circle. There's a circle. Those are called gyres. So, anyway. Um, so, currents are going to move... Um, the water around the ocean kind of like a river would and so um they're driven by differences in heating and cooling some are really rapid and powerful like the, the gulf stream if it weren't for the gulf stream um you know northern europe is really at the same latitude as parts of uh canada that are just covered in ice and would not be fun and like eskimos live there okay like same latitude where eskimos live is is northern europe and so uh, we have the gulf stream um uh, providing heat to northern europe and that's why um they can do okay this upwelling here this is important we're going to revisit this when i teach you el nino um but upwelling what ends up happening um so this if this is the gulf of not the gulf of california if this is the coast of california and i just showed you that that um current from alaska is blowing along the coastline. Oh, this happens on every coastline. Have you went to the beach, put your towel down, got the water, 10 minutes later, you're way down the, you're way down the beach and you're stuck like over there. Has that happened to you? Yeah, so the, <laughs> this happens. And so you have this long shore, shore current, you don't need to know that, but um, the wind is gonna blow along the coastline. And so when that happens, this water is gonna be displaced. And so it kind of leaves a void and water is gonna upwell or come up to the surface here. And so when it does, here's all the deep, when things die in the ocean, they sink to the bottom, right? And they decay, and there's a lot of, um, I think it's called like ocean snow. Have you ever seen those like diving pictures where they're like looking for that angler fish or that, they're like looking for that one whale, and there's like all that white dead stuff floating around? It's called, I think it's called ocean snow. But anyway, all the cold uh, water here at the bottom, it's going to have a lot of this decayed detritus dead stuff and the upwelling as this gets blown to the side this is going to come up and replace that water it's going to bring um it's going to bring nutrients and that's going to provide a great fishing ground so that's called upwelling um and we're going to go into this a little bit more um when we talk about el nino y'all know y'all heard about we had an el nino this year right okay good so anyway that's called upwelling um brings cold deep water to the surface really rich in nutrients provides lucrative fishing grounds um downwelling also happens and downwelling is really important because the deep water in the ocean it doesn't have any oxygen the deep water in the ocean is rich in nutrients but it has no oxygen and so or has little oxygen i should say and so downwelling will actually take and put oxygen rich water um at the um, bottom of the ocean. So downwelling is also important. It doesn't help the fishing at the surface like upwelling does, but it is important. Does it just kind of intermittently occur across the middle of the ocean or there's surface? There's specific places and it's usually along coastlines. Has to do with the currents. So this is kind of what Daniel was talking about. Um, I don't know if he meant to be talking about it, but um, what ends up happening, um, there are deep water currents and they're they're blue here. And so this whole system starts. Okay, so here's my jet stream, right? Christopher Columbus, I'm heading back. Right here, right? That's happening. Okay, so here, and, and this is what I was talking about. Look, Northern Europe, if I take this, here's Scandinavia, right? Like this is very cold and unpleasant in Canada. And this is an okay place to live. I mean, it's, it's cold, but not nah, summer, so it's, it's okay. Um, but look, like here's the UK, you guys. 
I mean, you don't realize how uh, high in latitude that is because it's pretty temperate. And it's only because of the jet stream that they can pull that off and, you know, have like a warm summer and, you know, be able to have a similar climate to us. But anyway, the Gulf Stream takes this warm water uh, to the North Atlantic. And then what happens here off the coast of Greenland is I'm going to draw you some, uh, some uh, ice. I got the right color for ice. I got it. I'm ready. Um, so the... There we go. So this is frozen, right? And so you have, um, when this ice forms, you guys know that when ice gets formed, it doesn't freeze the salt in it, right? And so you get ice formed here, and then really salty, really cold water. Are you following me now? Only fresh water freezes. Um, so you have ice at the surface, fresh water. This is fresh water, no salt. What happens is the really cold, salty water that's left over after the ice freezes off the coast of Greenland, it drives this deep, deep at the bottom of this plain uh, cold water, and it goes all the way around the, um, the oceans, all the way around the world. And so there's this warm current part of it, and then there's that cold current part of it. But it all starts off the coast of Greenland. Have you ever seen like the day after tomorrow? Yeah, and so in the movie, where it had like these, you know, hurricanes made out of snowstorms, which is like not possible, that what ends up happening in the movie, they say um, that this shuts down, and so this shuts down, and then um, if this, if it, with climate change, here's the issue, with climate change, if this ice stops being made, then this warm, uh, excuse me, this cold water stops sinking to the bottom and driving this whole thing, which means this warm water quits going to Northern Europe, which means everybody that lives up here, nice and toasty right now, will not get to live there nice and toasty. So this is a huge issue. Isn't that kind of terrifying? We're on the right side of the ocean. They're on the getting uh, messed over side of the ocean. Um, so, you know, the Arctic Ocean, as far as the mm -hmm. ice coverage, it decreases every year, and we're having like every... Every winter, there's like a record for less ice, less ice, less ice. What less ice means less cold, salty water left over after the ice is made. So, um, terrifying, terrifying. Notice off the coast of uh, Antarctica, it's only cold, deep water because you have all this ice down here getting made. And so you only have cold, salty water, you know, going and sinking there uh, and contributing to that cold, um, deep current. So that's called thermo temperature, haline. Haline, um, the mineral salt, sodium chloride, is halite. Halite, uh, this is talking about salt. So thermal haline circulation is temperature and salty circulation. And it's this current system, I just showed it to you. Warmer, fresher water stays at the surface. And cold, uh, salty water goes beneath it. And so that part that I just kind of spent some time on off the coast of um, Greenland, it is um, what brings the water uh, to Europe, and it makes it much warmer than it, than it should be. Uh, and then there's that downwelling there. So if you're asking about a specific place, Daniel, where downwelling happens, um, it happens off the coast of Greenland because uh, that cold water uh, is frozen and sinks. So, thanks. You're in the phone club now. I don't think y'all are cute. Um, so, anyway, so that's where downwelling happens and upwelling. But, moving on. Um, if it were to somehow, if that shut down, and I was trying to tell you this a second ago, but if it were to shut down, the issue is um, that melting ice, it would run into the North Atlantic, and then that surface water would be less salty and be less dense and that whole system would shut down um, and Europe would rapidly cool and it's already slowing um, so we don't know we don't know if it'll actually stop or if it'll just mess some things up we'll just have to find out we're running this big science experiment with the earth it's, it's a lot of fun um, and so we've talked about CO2 we talked about climate change that's actually the next unit but I've already talked about it like seven times but I'm gonna tell you again when we burn fossil fuels, we make carbon dioxide. Is that like ringing a bell? Maybe. Um, and so when we make carbon dioxide, not only um, does that um, warm the earth, it actually makes the oceans more acidic. 
which is sort of terrifying. Um, and so CO2 in the water is, carbon, is carbonic acid. Carbonic acid is what soda is made out of, like carbonated water, comma, corn syrup, comma, caramel color, like those are the ingredients of Coke. Have you ever read them? So when we're having CO2 and it's dissolving into the ocean, we are basically making the ocean very acidic, which is kind of sad. And so um, what ends up happening when you have ocean acidification, sea creatures like corals, they can't make shells because um, calcium, we talk about calcium carbonate in here? That happens. Yes. Calcium carbonate is what makes seashells out of. Well, um, it's also what you make rollies out of. Rollies are an antacid, right? So the calcium carbonate in the seashells actually like chemically reacts with the carbonic acid and it, it neutralizes the water. But when it neutralizes the water, the seashell is gone just like the rollie gets dissolved. So that's a problem. That's how sad, right? And yes, sir? Uh, do you think the changing in pH and the dissolving of carbon dioxide also changes the um, freezing temperature? Like at the North Pole or something? Um, as far as gas being dissolved, mm -hmm. carbon dioxide isn't polar or anything, so it wouldn't react as far as like creating an interaction with water. So probably not. Okay. Yeah. Um, it has to do with if the water molecules are attracted to the molecule that you're talking about or not. It's attracted to sodium and chloride because those are ions. Yeah, the CO2, dioxide. no. I don't think that would have a big play in that. Um, anyway, so if you don't have coral reefs, coral reefs are a nursing ground for fish. They come there, they reproduce, um, a huge biodiversity hotspot. Yes, ma'am? What was the acid that CO2 makes? Oh, it makes carbonic acid. Carbonic acid? Yes, ma'am. Okay, and that's what reacts with the calcium. Carbonate. Yes, so carbonic acid. And so um, this is why, and we talked about this already, like normal rainwater is acidic because the carbon dioxide in the air gets added to the water, makes carbonic acid. Is that like, do you hear my, do you hear my voice saying that to you before that happened? Does that ring a bell? Um, so anyway, like I actually have, this is so crazy. I just see this out of my corner of my eye. So if I have like, I have sparkling water here. Isn't that fun? And so this, that is uh, carbonic acid. And again, it's just soda water. So that, that is what we're doing to the ocean. And you can imagine, I mean, you've seen like the videos where people take like, you know, a Coke and pour it in a toilet to clean the toilet. I don't, I don't know if somebody would do that, but they do it. So anyway, um, as far as the parts per million carbon dioxide versus a Coke, I mean, it's obviously less, but that's the same idea. So anyway, um, so here's some good words to know. You have the photic zone in the ocean. Photic means light. Um, and the same thing happens in uh, a lake, anything photic is like, some people say photic, photic I think is the right way to say it. Um, open ocean, so if we're thinking about like sharks and things, or sea turtles, pelagic, if you're thinking about open ocean swimmers, schools of tuna, for example, those are pelagic um, organisms. Benthic always means bottom. No matter what you're talking about, benthic means bottom. Um, you know, we had talked about how um, most things do photosynthesis, but at the bottom of the ocean, at that mid-ocean ridge where the magma is coming up, that's where we have chemosynthesis occurring. I kind of feel like I need to show you that, but let's see if I can find it. Do, 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 do. Oh, it was just right here. Should be... There it is. So when we talked about chemosynthesis, do you remember how we had, um, you would make glucose and like sulfuric acid um, and they would use hydrogen sulfide? So this is where your deep sea, um, your deep sea hydrothermal environments where chemosynthesis happens, they happen, it happens here at that, um, that mid-ocean ridge there. So I mean, just trying to tie in what we've already talked about together. Because I know it's a lot of stuff. Yes, sir. Do you think the acidity uh, that's um, basically put in the deep ocean ridges by the chemosynthesis will affect the ability for shell organisms to be there? Like, because it wouldn't make it more acidic if they're producing the sulfuric acid? I'm not. The things that are there, like shrimp, tube worms, there's not any. There, your level of carbon, excuse me, calcium carbonate in the bottom oceans is 
as minimal anyway. So you wouldn't have that nutrient anyway because that's going to be more prevalent along coastlines. So if you think about it, shelled creatures don't live in the middle of the open ocean. Where do you think of one? Zero things. Okay, so in the middle of the open ocean, clams live? No, I'll say Okay, so right. So that's the issue. They're normally going to be along coastlines because you wouldn't have those nutrients there anyway. But that's a good question. Um, so anyway, I uh, did that. Inner, inner, inner tidal zones. Um, <clears throat> those are your littoral ecosystems. And inner tidal, that just means it's between, uh, they're making this like way too hard. Inner tidal, inner means in between. So it's the mark between the high tide. If that's my high tide mark right here and my low tide. So anything... Anything in between there is the intertidal zone. So basically, if you're going to the beach, the intertidal zone will be that area where if you put your stuff and you sit there long enough, you're going to get some water on it. You know how you go to the beach, you kind of have to watch out for the tides, too high tides, too low tides today. The intertidal zone is that part that sometimes is covered in water and sometimes it's not. It depends on the tides. Um, so anyway, the tides, I could go into what causes those. Not a huge deal on the AP exam, but you do have two high tides and two low tides a day. Um, and that has to do with the rotation of Earth. I can show you. Do you understand where tides come from? I mean, do you get it? Yeah. You might want to tell me. Do you want me to show you? It's from the gravitational pull of the moon and the sun gets the Earth and it pulls the water. Yeah. Is it right? Do you want me to show you? We don't need to see it. Well, since the moon's orbit is elliptical. Doesn't matter. All right, moving on. Um, so anyway, um, at, in intertidal ecosystems, um, you have uh, huge differences in um, moisture and salinity throughout the day, and so you're going to get um, a good amount of um, niches. Now, we don't have rocky intertidal zones in in Georgia. Not really. Um, we don't have rocky shorelines. You have to go out west to see this. Um, and so if you do go, and I, I went to Hawaii, and they had rocky intertidal shores, and I was just like in love because I saw all these animals. Um, but here's the high, light, high tide, right? And here's the low tide. And throughout the day, as this water goes up and down, you're going to have these little pools, these tidal pools, and um, these pools will be filled with water. And sometimes they'll be dry, sometimes they won't be. And so you'll get in these little nooks and crannies, starfish and different kind of urchins and stuff. Um, we don't have this here because it's all sand, and so you don't have as many niches. And so um, really complicated, not actually. And if we look here, this is the intertidal zone between the high tide and the low tide, and then the supertidal is above that. Um, that's not very important, but um, it's just in between the high tide and low tide. And um, it's a lot more interesting when you have a rocky coastline. So anyway, um, the rocky shores, they will provide you with these, like I said, these tide pools or tidal pools. You'll get lots of little animals in there, lots of diversity. We, in, you know, off of our coast of Georgia and off the coast of Florida, we don't have that level of biodiversity because we don't have all these rocks. We don't have all these little nooks and crannies and pools. We just have sand and some more sand. And so you might have like, one little crab kind that lives, you know, you know those little shady looking little crabs that'll come out. Those are kind of scary to me. Um, you know, they're like, just a little bit, and then they scurry off. Um, that's it. I mean, you don't see a whole lot else. You don't see uh, different kinds of organisms. So, um, yeah, sandy intertidal zones have less biodiversity because that there's less niches. There's ne less jobs in the ecosystem to do. Um, and so we're going to talk a little bit about um, wetland areas and uh, brackish water. And so this is a salt marsh. Have you ever been to Savannah and drove uh, over the bridges to go out to like Tybee or Jekyll Island? So this is, ex yeah, and so that's what that looks like, yeah? Great. I like it. I, I, I went and did that when I taught middle school. I took like a, a group. It was fun. So salt marshes are what we have. If you live in a temperate area, um, and I, that's right there. Temperate means 30 to 60 degrees north of the equator. You're going to have salt marshes on your coastline where rivers go into the ocean. Where a river flows into the ocean, you're going to have salt marsh. And um, so what's going to happen is um, the tide is going to kind of come up. 
and it's going to make this area salty part of the day. And then when the tide goes down, it's going to be a little bit more fresh as the river is running into the area. Um, and they're going to be really high in primary productivity. If you remember, if you remember, um, they're going to have um, a lot of nutrients coming in from the river as, at the mouth of the river before it dumps into the ocean. Um, and they're going to have a lot of um, salt tolerant grasses um, that can live in salty water and fresh water. Um, and then these are a critical habitat for birds, uh, migratory birds, coastal birds, commercial fish, shellfish. What ends up happening is you have these ocean dwelling organisms and they come into the salt marsh and it provides them with protection as they reproduce. And so I know that when I went to Savannah uh, one time, we saw a lot of dolphins in this kind of salt marshy river area um, that had come in from the ocean. Have you guys seen that when you went to the coast of Georgia? Some dolphins and yes. things? Yeah, yeah. Got, like almost on our boat. It like came up and wanted us to like touch it, but we weren't allowed to. But it was in the, was it kind of in the salt marsh area? Yeah, we were kind of, on this little river estuary thing. Right, and so this is the estuary, right, and so that, right, okay. So um, they help to filter out pollution. A lot of the salt uh, marsh plants, they are, um, they can do bioremediation. They can pick up heavy metals into their stalks. And so um, they, another ecosystem service, they help to stabilize the shorelines against storm surges. So they kind of act as a sponge. If you are to get a lot of rain, they can absorb the extra rain so it doesn't flood inland. Um, and then a lot of people, unfortunately, these areas have been lost because people want to have businesses along the coast and they want to open up areas. Yes. Um, I was wondering, obviously, like the plants are able to survive whenever they take taking out pollution, but does that affect, like, if we were to consume those animals, would that, like, yeah. It's not animals, it's the plants that do that. Yeah. Yeah. You wouldn't want to eat, like this would be like something That's like a, a cat nine tail. Um, you wouldn't eat yeah. that. These are not edible plants. Okay. Um, and so this, have you ever seen this off the coast of Georgia? You ever seen that in real life? I've seen it. Looks like life of pie. Uh, okay, good. And life of pie, that was, didn't it happen off the, I know it was at like a tropical place. I know it's yeah. happened in India, right? That's yeah, it went across the Right, okay, and so this is what's called a mangrove uh, tree, and so I'm not going to do a very good job drawing a shrimp here, but I'm going to do it anyway. There's a lot of little shrimp, 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 and then there's a lot of fish that get up in here, and they're all safe and everything, and so the thing about mangroves, this is, if you are in a tropical area, which you do not live in a tropical area, but if you were to go to Key West, you have to go all the way to Key West to see one of these. Um, they have to be that close to the equator. Um, that's the only place in the continental United States to have them. Um, you can see a mangrove swamp. So instead of having a salt, salt marsh for an estuary, if you go tropical enough, you'll see mangroves. And so mangroves are these specialized trees that um, have roots that um, go down and also angle up. So they get enough air either way. And so they, they provide a lot of protection for uh, profitable um, fish and shrimp populations. And they also are popular for um, marine, as far as ocean dwelling organisms come in and reproduce and then go back out to the sea. So these are mangroves, that tree, that picture of that tree, that's the mangrove, the tree is the mangrove. Um, these forests, they basically, if you're in a tropical, so you're below 30 degrees in latitude, you're on mangrove shops, swamps instead. Um, but these mangrove forests, I should say, um, they're salt tolerant trees. They can live in these changing water levels. The water levels still going to be changing, uh, two high tides and two low tides a day. And like I said, their, their roots curve up for oxygen and also down for support. And they're very important for nesting for migratory birds, nurseries for fish, shellfish like shrimp, food, medicine. Um, you can use a, the wood as a building material. Um, a lot of research there that could go into the medicinal properties of the mangrove. Um, and so huge biodiversity, uh, or excuse me, ecosystem, yeah, biodiversity and ecosystem services. Now, if you are on a coast in a temperate latitude, or you're on a coast in a tropical latitude, and you're at a coast, what happens to your property value? It goes, up. it goes through the roof, right? And so these areas, both salt marsh and mangrove forest, have been really decimated 
by marinas, by hotels, by people who want to build there because the property is very valuable. But you can see that also the ecosystem services that happen there are very valuable. So half of the world's mangrove forests are gone. Like I said, they've been developed. Sweet, and strip farming has taken a big part of that. Once destroyed, you know, if you take and remove salt marsh or remove um, mangrove forests, it, you know, it's profitable at the beginning because you can build there, you can have farming for fish or whatever. Um, but these ecosystem services of filtering pollutions, of pollutants, of uh, absorbing extra storm water, um, of, of kind of dampering effects of uh, hurricanes, for example, that really makes it a lot worse. So anyway, um, kind of important to keep them intact. Um, so estuaries, those are both examples of estuaries. Estuaries are where you have brackish water. Let me give you that. So I have that on here. Um, brackish water is water that is part salty and part fresh. Um, and it can change throughout the day as tides go up and down. Um, and so estuaries are where rivers flow into the ocean in a mix of salt and fresh water. Um, again, critical habitat for shores and birds. Um, so... And also, they have been uh, overfished and developed. So, all right, this is the kelp forest. Who's been to the Georgia Aquarium? When you go to the Georgia Aquarium, there is uh, there's a touch tank, and then there is uh, like a tank with like kelp like this, and that's where the sea otters are. That's that same room where the sea otters are. It's got the beluga whales in there. Are you feeling me? Yeah, have you been to the aquarium? Yeah, you know, it's got seahorses, that's the same area with seahorses, and then the penguins are up the hill. Are you, are you, are you there in the aquarium? So, anyway, um, the, the sea kelp there, um, or excuse me, the kelp forest there, that was one of the, um, the, the places that they were, they were speaking about. Um, and do y'all remember the keystone species that lives in the kelp forest, everybody? The sea otter. Do you, is that ringing a bell? Guess what's there in the aquarium in the kelp forest? The sea otter. And it says, like, on a big sign, Keystone species. I'm not lying. So, um, on, on the AP exam, they'll just want you have to just know that a wolf is a keystone species for Yellowstone, and you just have to know that the sea otter is the keystone species for the kelp forest. You just you just have to know that. Like they just gonna pretend like you know that. So keep that in your mind if you're gonna take that test. You need to write that down. Um, trying to help y'all out. And so, what is kelp? Kelp is actually big algae. It's really large algae. It looks like a very complex organism, but no, it's, it's very simple. It's algae. And it can get pretty big. Um, and it uh, forms along temperate coasts. And basically, this is the most famous place, the coast of California and Oregon, Washington. So the Pacific Northwest, really. They provide a lot of shelter and food for organisms, and just like our friends, um, the mangroves uh, and, and the salt marsh, they can uh, absorb extra energy from storms so that, you know, your coastline doesn't get as damaged. Um, and then kelp is it's used in food. It's, you know, if you've ever eaten sushi, that's what they're wrapping the, you know, the kelp is what they're wrapping that in. Have you ever eaten, or not eaten, have a, like a beauty product or food that has like carrot Bean in it. Do you ever see that word? It's in a lot of beauty products, but kelp is very important economically. I'm pretty sure I said that wrong. I don't care. So anyway, you can use it in paper, soap, lots of stuff. So kelp is a thing. Um, notice the sea otters and things were on there, but I'm just connecting back. So coral reef, huge biodiversity. Some of the best biodiversity on earth. Second only to uh, second only to tropical rainforest. Um, so, anyway, uh, there's the word I've been talking about for three weeks. Uh, coral reefs are masses of calcium carbonate um, made from the skeletons of marine animals. So, coral <laughs> is a character on The Walking Dead. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, a coral is a little animal. It's, you know, you know okay, it's a relative to an, 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 an oh my god. <laughs> An anemone. There you go. And I probably don't know how to say it again. So, an anemone is this little stinging animal that Tom Fish and Nemo have seen at movie camp. Okay. So, anyway, the coral is related to that. The coral is actually a little animal, very small animal. The coral reef is when that little animal says, hey, let's get a relationship and live together. And so, um, what ends up happening, the coral is this. Um, 
this symbiotic relationship between an algae uh, and the coral animal. And so they live together. Basically, the shell is made by the animal, and then the algae help to provide food. And the pretty colors of coral reefs, that is related to what color the algae is. Because some algae is brown, some is green, some is red, whatever. And so the pretty colors on coral happen to come from this algae that it lives with. And that's, you know, what colors of the chlorophyll in the algae. Am I speaking a different language when I said that, you know, algae is a photosynthesizer and it has chlorophyll and chlorophyll can be different colors? Are you feeling me? Yes. Okay. So anyway, um, they're kind of an extension of the shoreline. It could be a barrier island or a ring. Um, an atoll, when we watched that I love a you thing, and then the, the, the sad island had all gone down to the bottom and there was that ring around it, that's an atoll. So it's really pretty. Um, so anyway, corals are tiny colonial little animals. Like I said, they're related to anemones. I did it. Yes, and jellyfish, and they sting. Um, but they capture passing food, and um, they also get a little bit of food from the uh, algae that they're friends with. And that they so this is a mutualistic relationship because the algae that it the so zoanthellae. There you go, that word. That's the that's the algae they're friends with. Um, then the zoanthellae get. Um, protection because they get a shell from the coral animal and the coral get a little bit of food from the zoanthellae. So anyway, when the the shells get dissolved because the ocean is acidic, then the algae dies because it doesn't have shelter and then the coral dies. So coral bleaching is, is what occurs. And so let me show you that. I feel like, there we go. Nope, that's not the answer. And so um, they get the colors from the zoanthellae. They, just like all the other things I just said, they protect shorelines from serving waves and storms, and they have high pro primary productivity, high biodiversity. So anyway, that was fun. Oh, yeah, here. Da, da, da. This is coral bleach, and I'll go back to this slide before. And so there's no color left. It's white. And the reason it's white, calcium carbonate is white. Um, after the zooxanthellae, the algae leaf, it leaves it white. And so why that happens, um, this bleaching is coming from climate change, uh, pollution. And when we say pollution, it could, we're really meaning a um, couple things. It could be um, the use um I don't know if y'all know this, but when you go and catch fish for an aquarium, like really fancy ocean fish, they actually stun them with cyanide, and they like paralyze the fish temporarily, and they'll capture it, and they'll take it to an aquarium or to sell a store for pets. Did you know they do that? Did, am I just like speaking a different language? Let me back up and tell you. So to capture really exotic tropical fish that live in coral reef, you can just kind of spray some cyanide at a low dosage, and it'll stun the fish, and you can pack it up and take it with you. Now, what ends up happening when people do that is that cyanide will poison the coral and it will die. And so that's the problem with coral bleach. And so when we talk about pollution, like you don't ever say pollution. That's what we mean. Or we can mean ocean water being too acidic out of the range of tolerance, right? And so that's what we, yes? Why do they have to spray it like through that close anyway? Why can't they just put it in the respiratory um, I think it's done from a distance. Oh, okay. Yeah. So it's not like they go off and just. Uh -uh. It would be like, it would be like for me maybe to carry. Because, oh, okay. I mean, it's hard, and you know because of the refraction of light, it's hard to really grab something underwater. You know, you, like you think it's there, but it's not really there. Maybe I've had that problem before. Yes. Sort of my life in the ocean. Um, and so, anyway, I'm just saying that it, it does help make it a little easier. So, um, oh, there it is. I just said all this. Um, it can also be um, algae blooms. Um, can smother coral, coral, I don't want to smother coral, um, jeez, and then the ocean acidification, like I said, it, 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 it keeps the, um, the actual reef structure, the skeleton made out of the, uh, calcium carbonate from forming, or it dissolves it once it's in place. All right, so there's bleaching, I already showed you that, um, and so there are some cold water, areas not as not as common um but they've been damaged by trawling and so when we talked about the um fishing at the beginning they get they get damaged that way so moving on and so these are my uh when i talked about zo uh, zooplankton and phytoplankton have i mentioned those words to you do you know what i'm talking about 
So phytoplankton, um, this is probably a phytoplankton right here. It's a plant-like plankton. That's the base of the food chain in the ocean. 70% um, of the biomass on Earth, if you weighed all the life on Earth, 70% would be phytoplankton in the ocean. That's impressive. Um, they make a lot of our oxygen that we breathe. Trees do make some too, but they make almost as much or if not as much more. So these are zooplankton. See how they look like little animals? And you go to the zoo to see animals, yeah? So phyto means plant, zo means animal, and so um, the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, and then small fish eat zooplankton, and then it moves up the food chain there. So this is your base of your, you know, ocean food chain. Um, and then there are, you know, the deep, deep areas. That's not really that important. Marine pollution is important. Um, so you have uh, the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. Um, I think that I think that I want to. Uh, there's a pretty good movie on the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. I can open it up to you. You can watch it on YouTube for a little extra credit. Does that sound good? Uh, I don't have time to show it to you, but it goes into this. Has anybody ever heard of the Great Pacific Garbage Patch? Yes. So in the middle of the Pacific, and there's actually a patch of garbage in the Atlantic. In the middle, did I kind of show you where the currents make a circle? Well, it kind of circles up all the trash in the middle of that gyre. And so there are these floating areas, huge areas like the size of Texas and the Pacific, where there's just little plastic debris just floating around. And so the seabirds are eating it, fish are eating it, it's getting stuck in their stomach because plastic doesn't react with acid. That's why, like, um, <laughs> I think it was Breaking Bad, like, who said to put the dead body in plastic barrel? Do y'all know what I'm talking about? And it went through the floor because... Like the acid and ceramics. <laughs> yeah, it's not... Um, anyway, so acid doesn't react with plastic. Like, that's that's just the thing. I would go into why. <laughs> um, but I don't want you... So, um, this plastic will float around for a long time, and it gets stuck in their stomachs, and it doesn't dissolve or anything. And so um, it will make them feel full or keep them from absorbing nutrients and kill them. And so it's really hard for that to break down. And so it's in these little pieces, pieces that are edible or even micro pieces that just, and we talked about those endocrine disruptors, how it acts like estrogen and it causes um, re reproductive problems. So this is all happening out in the ocean in the Pacific. Um, plastics and things can also entangle wildlife. There's that classic like Coke, um, you know, six pack. Thing, yeah. the ring song, is that, and then there's like it always gets stuck around something but there's abandoned nets or is it are a bigger problem I would say so anyway um, like I was saying about the plastic the issue with uh, solid debris in the ocean um, this is crazy the average fish in the Great Pacific garbage patch has um, and I think that should say more than two probably more like 22 um, over 40% of albatross chicks' premature death have been linked to, you know, eating pieces of plastic. Because, uh, you know, the parents will give them food. Gross. Um, lots of problems with this. So, 100,000 marine mammal and 1 million seabird deaths a year. So, seabird populations are really taking a toll, uh, are having a toll taken uh, because of this. Oops. It's kind of sad. But the, there's a documentary selling, like... It's like an hour, um, so it's pretty good. So anyway, oh, okay, that keeps happening to me. I don't know why. Oh, here we go. So here's the um, here's the floating pieces of plastic, and so the on the left hand side, the guy that's holding the jar there, that's what he just took a sample of the water. The water there looks like that. It is full of those little pieces of plastic, and so on the right hand side, you have the albatross. So you can see. Um, on Midway Island, which is in the middle of the Pacific, near this gyre, there's just dead birds everywhere. And I'm talking about everywhere. And then the, the carcasses are there. The carcasses have decomposed. Obviously, microbes don't eat the plastic. And so the plastic will be laid out, and their skeleton will be there. And the skeleton and feathers of plastic. And it's disgusting. But um, I think you would enjoy watching that. And it's on YouTube. So I'll, I'll let y'all make, I'm going to make myself a note right now to kind of give y'all, um, get y'all the website for that and I'll leave it for you. So let me write that down. Plastic. Okay, got it. Um, so it's really sad. It's heartbreaking. Um, another thing about that plastic I had told you guys that it, um, it contains things like BPA. That's BPA right there. Phthalates. 
um, that's that word phthalates, they're both um, endocrine disruptors. And so they um, mess with your hormones and they cause reproductive problems. Um, they're not easily removed. There is a, this is a pretty important law, the Marine Debris Research Prevention and Reduction Act. Um, and so um, that was supposed to put money forward to reduce some plastic in the oceans and it helped a little bit. Um, cost a lot of money as far as fishing loss, tourism loss. Is there anything or any natural process at all that gets rid of plastic? Um, so they've done some research and they actually have found some bacteria that consume plastic and they're working on genetically modifying that and yeah, I, I read that like two weeks ago. So that that's a thing. Yeah, so it's pretty recent, but it's a thing. So, um, and so what you have here, preventing that ocean of uh, plastic contamination, you have these floating buoys that are keeping the plastic at the shore from going into the water, and then they're cleaning it up. It's really sad. Oops. Um, so what ends up happening with oil in the ocean? That's another type of water pollution. So you don't have to say water pollution. You can actually talk about something. Mr. Freeman. Yes? Would you send Judith Smith to admin for the hall, please? Yes, ma'am. Sir, sorry. He didn't hear me, I'm sure. Here you go, Judith. Just take that. Um, and so a lot of the oil and natural gas comes from sea floor deposits. Um, drilling, um, like the Gulf of Mexico is a very popular place for drilling for oil. So is the North Sea. Um, that's um, in Europe. But anyway, um, drilling in some places is banned. Um, it's usually banned in places that have lucrative fisheries or a lot of tourism. And so um, if you go out to California, you see a lot more oil rigs off the coast. But if you go to like Panama City, you won't see that. Like because it's so rich in tourism for people going to the beach, they won't allow it. But um, it does, there is oil off the coast, so they just sort of won't allow it where tourism, because it's really ugly. It's ugly to look out and see a big oil rig. So they're farther out and off the coast where tourism is big. So the biggest oil spill ever was the Deepwater Horizon. And um, before that, the, deep, the biggest oil spill was um, the Exxon Valdez, but um, that was in 1986. But this definitely trumped it. Uh, huge, huge, huge amounts of oil. Um, it spilled 18 gallons, 1800 gallons a minute for three months straight. It was a lot. It was in the millions of gallons. I don't remember the number. Um, and it caused a lot of problems in four states. And um, the thing is, we had talked about some, let me finish this first. Um, we had talked about some bacteria have figured out how to eat plastic. That's really cool. More oil is spilled naturally from seeps in the ocean uh, continental slope than will ever be spilled by boat. But it's slow and there are bacteria that have evolved to consume oil and consume natural gas. Like there's methanogens they're called. They eat methane. And so when this happened, like BP got super lucky because the Gulf of Mexico had bacteria that could consume their oil. So like when they went to clean it up, it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. It really didn't cause like as far as um, like oil spill pollution along the coastline, it wasn't as bad as they thought it was going to be. And, and the scientists were really shocked by like how did they all get cleaned up? And so the bacteria, they did the research and the bacteria actually ate it. Now that's fine, that's good, but what do bacteria do when they consume waste? What do they use? Oxygen. They use oxygen and the Gulf of Mexico is already a huge hypoxic zone because of the runoff from agriculture. So it made that dead zone even worse. There's areas where the dissolved oxygen is like zero for miles and miles and miles. So it's really sad. But anyway, um, this happened. Um, BP did have to pay. And um, y'all remember from there for a little while, like BP would run commercials for like, come to Florida, come to Alabama. Do you, do you remember that? They, they were made to do that. Yes, what's your question? Um, what percentage of, like, obviously you said there's millions of gallons. Natural. It's about 55%. Oh, no, not natural, but like... Um, I have a graph. Do you think that is uh, the oil that we use, like, on a daily basis or that is drilled? Or, like, is that a large in the scheme of things? I don't... I, did, I don't think I caught your question. What yeah. is your... What, what was your question? In, in the large scheme of things, like, how much oil is drilled and... Um, per day? Like, yeah, per day. Like, do you think that's a significant portion of the oil? Of, of what oil? But, like, all of it. 
for how is the, all the oil that we use is what we use each day a significant portion. Mathematically, no, because that's what we drill in a day. But we drill out millions of barrels every day. Like I know that's the thing. But I mean, as far as what how much we have left, we've used over half of the oil reserves. That happened in about 2005. We hit Hubbard's peak. But I mean, we all is like the unit A. So we'll get into more of that later. Thanks. Oh, I did send a. I did send an email. Yeah, I thought you did, but... Okay. Anyway, um, so, yeah. Um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, that, that, was a, that was a big thing. So, there's, um, this is, they're skimming up the oil. This is called the skimmer boat, and we'll get into that when we get into, um, we'll talk a little bit about that when we talk about um, oil a little bit more. But they're skimming the oil off the surface because oil does float on water, right? And that, that happens. And so you can skim it off the surface. Um, the, oil pollution, uh, the Oil Pollution Act of 1990, this was a byproduct. I love how our country is. We're like, we make a huge mess, and then we freak out, and then we fix it after the fact. So this was a byproduct of the Exxon Valdez spill that happened in 1986. And so four years later, the federal government put together this law to safeguard areas because the area, the um, the Exxon Valdez spill is still there. Like there are still parts um, that are still polluted in that part of Alaska. So it's um, in colder climates, it doesn't break down as quickly. And so um, it was unfortunate, but it's, it's probably more polluted, I would say, than the, the place where it happened in the Gulf of Mexico just like five years ago. So anyway, this um, this law required that all ships have double hulls, and what that means is that it has two layers of metal between the oil and the ocean, and um, the oil spill in uh, 1986 with the Exxon Valdez, Exxon Valdez uh, what happened there was um, it hit uh, it hit like a reef, and so it poked a hole in the um, the hole, and so they said, well, let's do double holes, and then that would help. So anyway, um, spills for tankers have decreased uh, as this has been slowly implemented. So now, now all ships have double holes, and it also put forward, you know, all these laws that we've been talking about, like the Surface Mining Control and Reclamation Act. You should probably have done that with mining. Is that ringing a bell? And so companies have to put money up in a bond first or a trust fund first. And so there's also a trust fund here for cleanup. And so this was the law that made BP clean up the Gulf of Mexico. If this had not been passed in 1990, then God only knows what would have happened. So it was great that this already went down, you know, even though it had been, um, you know, 20 years before that happened. So it was, it was handy. So this is what I was talking about, you guys. Um, if you look at the percentages, from where we actually get oil in the ocean, um, natural seeps uh, is the is way bigger than anything that we spill. Um, so natural seeps is here. Non-point source pollution, point and non-point. That's something from chapter 15 that you know you didn't have yet. But point source pollution is like if you can point to it, like we talked about yesterday with Plant Bowen. Can you point to the pipe on Plant Bowen? Yes, yeah, so that's point source. Non-point source pollution would be something like all the parking lot cars leaking oil and running off into the ocean from the parking lot. Can you point to that? No. So anyway, um, the biggest part here is natural seeps and then non-point source pollution. So that's just all the little leaky boats in the ocean all put together. And then your tankers. Um, so extraction does leak some as well. Um, and so here are some of the biggest oil spills. I'll finish this up tomorrow. See y'all. Thanks. Alright, so what we had mentioned yesterday was that uh, the, the mass majority or largest source, I should say, of um, in petroleum input in the ocean actually comes from natural seeps. And so because oil seeps out from the um, ocean floor, well, there are bacteria that have evolved to eat it. And we had also talked a little bit about how those help to clean up the Gulf uh, um, Deepwater Horizon oil spill. That, that caused some more hypoxia because as the oil was consumed, they also used up the oxygen the bacteria did. Um, so the thing about seafood, and we had talked about this a little bit, um, when we burn coal, we're talking about mercury, for example. When we burn coal, most of the mercury in the, the 
the oceans and the atmosphere is coming from burning coal. And so that coal uh, makes the mercury, and the mercury settles out on the ground, the mercury settles out in the ocean and uh, in lakes and stuff. It's only in water that there are bacteria that can change that mercury to methyl mercury. There's no bacteria like that in grass. So that's why when you're pregnant, you don't have to worry about eating steak. See what I mean? There's not a final thing that doesn't exist. You don't have to worry about eating chicken. But you have to worry about eating seafood, and there's seafood contaminated with mercury. And also lake um, fish are contaminated with mercury because there's bacteria in water that can do this. And so mercury contamination um, from coal um, combustion, that bioaccumulates and biomagnifies. Now what this word means, that this means it um, gets stored in one organism. Biomagnifies means it gets larger as you go up the food chain. Uh, we talked about that a little bit, how it kind of increases through the food chain. And we're going to talk about it again in Unit 9. So um, that's not on this test uh, as far as like those two words and do you really know the difference between them. But mercury contamination is something that you need to understand. And you need to understand that the highest mercury levels are going to be at the top of the food chain. So, you know, when you are pregnant, you have to work. And there are small children. Uh, anytime you have any kind of neurological development occurring, you need to um, eat at the lower level of food chain. I'm talking about shrimp and fish farm, and I remember talking about it now. Um, so anyway, uh, avoid shorefish, shark, and albacore tuna. Albacore tuna is a very large, high trophic level tuna. And you want to eat stuff like catfish, salmon, uh, mite tuna, bit, uh, shrimp spine. And um, there are other health advisories. Sometimes you'll have um, problems with like a an, an algae bloom and that can cause uh, problems um, so I know my parents uh, they they went to live in Florida and there's a really good oyster place it was like Hunt's Oysters have you ever been there uh, you said Panama City I don't know you know the Red Knit Riviera right uh, well there you go um, I'll be sure to avoid it um, just because like every like I always see a bunch of people from Bartow County like they all just go to P PC me baby woo! Um, <laughs> Um, at the oyster bar, they have, have a lot of oysters, and then we went one time, and they weren't able to serve, like, some oysters, or not as much. They had to get them from a different place. Like, they usually get them real local, but they had to get them from a different place because there was a harmful algae bloom. And so, harmful algae blooms um, can cause <clears throat> neurotoxins uh, to get into the water. And so, um, this is also the same thing I was talking about that caused that, caused that fish kill in Florida. Yes, sir? Um, even if it's a not ha it, it, when I talk about harmful algae bloom, I'm talking about one that releases toxins oh. that, yeah, so all algae blooms have problems because, it's just those the ones have toxins. Yeah, I'm not, I'll explain that. I do, I did want to talk about that. So if this is a lake and this is the bottom of the lake, that's the lake, right? Okay. And then I have some aquatic plants that live at the bottom of the lake. That looks good. All right. Now, if that, I have an algae bloom. The algae bloom is going to um, kind of float on top of the water, and it's going to increase the turbidity of the water. And so these benthic plants will not be able to perform photosynthesis. Now, it's... What? They can't see. I thought you were correcting me for a second, and I'm like, I was like, no, that was all right. Um, I had a lot of fun picking out the... Um, the um, what is that called? The little loopy thing? Oh, the gift. Yeah, I had a lot of fun picking that out for that. I was like, which one of these really tells how I felt about that? <laughs> but I picked the octopus because I was like, that's the water and it's funny. If y'all don't know what I'm talking about, I tweeted something about Daniel and I didn't mention it. Say. But anyway, any algae bloom is going to mat, when I say mat, I mean like cover like a mat, the top of the water. And it's going to increase the turbid turbidity of the water. And that's going to, even though the algae itself can. Uh, produce uh, glucose and do photosynthesis from the sunlight. Anything below it is going to be blocked out. So these, uh, what I'm talking about this, these harmful algae blooms, they're also called HABs, HABs, just for fun, I'm just telling you. Um, they will um, sometimes be like a brown tide or a red tide, that's what they're called, and they um, are actually um, neurotoxins. The toxins they put off are neurotoxins, and so they can make you sick if you eat them. They can kill fish. So it's kind of no joke. And so this can um, cause economic loss because fishing um, industries can be impacted. And then also people can get sick. Um, and, and so they won't go to the beach. You can't swim in water with this kind of algae. So, and don't eat the affected organisms. 
So I've, I've seen those advisory slides. So here's kind of what a red tie looks like. Um, I saw a really interesting, y'all know the Bible how I was talking about in uh, Exodus, um, not like preaching to or anything, but like when the water turned to blood and there was something to drink. Like some, some people, like, I saw it like a video talking about how they thought maybe that was like a red tie or something. I, I don't know. That, that, that's not, don't like quote me on that, but I just thought that was interesting. But the water does turn red, and so um, that's uh, not, not just ugly, it's also dangerous. Anyway, um, so basically all of the major fish stocks in the wild have been overfished, um, and so that's kind of scary. If you look at how we have captured fish here, um, we've pretty much leveled out since about 1990. Um, got a tiny bit, but the thing is, if you look at the overall fish haul, and I'm talking about how much we have pulled in, it hasn't really increased. But the fact uh, that's kind of terrifying about this is how much energy and how much time we're spending to get the same amount of fish or to go farther out to sea, probably using more advanced technology. And so even though our fish capture is staying the same, the amount of work that we're having to put into it is increasing. So that's that marginal cost idea. We've already caught all the easy fish, the, the like Grand Banks and Georgia Banks. Those have been caught close because they were right off the coast. And so um, the China thing is... Uh, maybe even under under um, reported, so they like to do that. So uh, productivity is going to decrease in the ocean. We're worried about all this. Aquaculture is a possible uh, a possible solution, um, and that's where you kind of fish farm. And so people have longed over fish. We've killed out a lot of the um, um, smaller cetaceans. Cetaceans is the word for whales. It's like C E A T A C A E N. Have you ever heard that word before? So if I'm talking about a dolphin or a whale, I'm talking about a cetacean. Anyway, um, just thought it would be fun to tell you about that. Um, so here's some types of fishing. You need to know these, and I'll show you them and talk about them. It makes me sad to do this because let me tell you what. Um, this is the first semester that, like, for this chapter, like, y'all would have had to pick one of these topics in the presentation. It was a lot of fun. I'm sad that I'm not going to do it. I don't think I've ever had to actually, like, get up here and teach this because, like, this is something that y'all would teach. I'm so upset, like, not upset, but, you know, I don't, I don't like to do this. I would rather y'all do things. So, anyway, a couple of different kinds of fishing um, practices you need to be aware of. They haven't asked about fishing and overfishing on the AP exam in, the, in several years. There's, like, three that I'm calling, like, population is overdue, um, fishing practice is overdue, and so is, uh, and El Nino is like a big time thing this year, and so I feel like they might ask about El Nino. But um, anyway, drip netting, what you do with drip netting is you have a floating um, kind of series of, of buoys, and they will um, kind of support this net, and the net is just is drifts. And so um, it has, um, the net is a certain size uh, to match the size of fish that you'd like to catch. If it's a real big fish, obviously it, it's not going to fit and it'll be able to swim away. If it's a little fish, too small for you, you don't want that, you don't want a baby fish, whatever, they can swim through the holes. So you want a medium-sized fish, those fish will swim partly through the net and then they'll get stuck in their gills. And so then they'll be stuck in the net and then you'll be able to pull this net in and the fish will be stuck in the net. So that's how that works. Um, this is awful for what's called bycatch. Bycatch is, I mean, can Nobody's out there looking to see what kind of fish are swimming into it. So you can have all different kinds of species getting caught. Seabirds getting caught. You can have um, cetaceans that have to come up to breathe, like quails and stuff getting caught. So that's the issue here. Um, so that's drip netting. And a lot of times, these will be left. Like, they won't get hauled in, and they'll just be in the ocean, hanging out, killing fish for years. And that's called uh, ghost nets. And so that's very sad. Um, anyway, the next one is uh, called long lining. This is very popular for things like shark and other like large, like marlin and stuff, uh, like very valuable large fish. And so what you'll do is you'll bait a bunch of hooks. These are all baited, and like a shark or something that will, you know, swim up and be like, oh, this looks good, and they'll get stuck on the hook, and then, then you'll be able to haul this in. Now, um, this is a huge problem for seabirds because seabirds have evolved to see something shiny in the water and think it's a small fish, and the seabird will dive down, it's dive down, and it will bite the hook, and it will swallow the hook, and then the seabird will drown because it can't get back up to breathe. Sea turtles, sea turtles need to come up and breathe, y'all, right? Sea turtles don't stand in the water forever. And so they will um, bite the hook, and they will drown. 
dolphins will drown, right? Things that have to come back up to the surface to breathe. And so you have also a huge problem here with um, bycatch because you're not selecting what you want, like stuff just getting caught. Um, and then the last one is called bottom trawling. This is what happened off the coast of um, New England with the Grands Bank and Georgia's Bank. There are cold water coral reefs, and those were an area of cold water coral reefs, and they were very highly productive. Now, ground fish, benthic fish, like, um, y'all know on Finding Nemo, that flounder has both eyes on the same side of his head? It lives on the bottom, right? And so that's why I can have, you know, both eyes on the same side of the head because it's not swimming like this. It's just like looking up, waiting for food. And so what you do for bottom fish or benthic fish is you do what's called bottom trawling. And so you take and you drag a weighted net across the ocean floor, and that's how you catch the fish. Now, the issue with this is if there's any reef, anything on the bottom, it is going to get ran over like a bulldozer. And so that reef is just completely killed. And so there are areas of Georgia's Bank that have been bottom trawled three, four, five, six times. So any kind of reef was done. It was dead. And so not only did they catch all the fish, they, they destroyed the habitat of the fish. So they can't even rebound now. So um, this then is um, this is called a, a seine, and so the, a lot of these are like a purse, and so what they'll do is they'll kind of close up like a drawstring bag. So you would close this up like a drawstring bag and pull it up. So anyway, that's how that goes. That's bottom trawling. So those are some uh, kind of notable fishing methods that you need to be aware of. Um, factory fishing is something else. Um, if I've seen some like always, oh, my husband is always watching those Alaska shows. Which, I mean, it's better than sports. At least it has, like, a story to it. Um, but anyway, um, a lot of those boats will catch fish. And then downstairs in the hull of the ship, they're, like, chopping the fish up and freezing them. And so those are called factory fishing vessels. Like, you catch the fish and package the fish all in one boat. And so then they go back out to the city, wherever the port is, and they'll offload their packages and then go back out and catch more fish. So it's called a factory fishing vessel. Um, these other types of fishing I just explained... So be familiar with these. Um, there you go. I, I mentioned all the, the big things that you need to know. There are other fishing uh, methods, but those are the, you know, like I said. Um, bycatch, I, I mentioned this word, but make sure that, you know, you understand it. In 2011, a report found that only um, about 17% of commercially harvested fish, um, excuse me, 17% of commercially harvested fish were caught unintentionally. So that means they weren't supposed to be caught. Um, drift netting, like I said, I, I, I mentioned this. Drift netting drowns dolphins and turtles and seals. Um, and so it's banned in international waters, but it's still used off of coastline. So uh, what is it, that first 50 miles of coastline before we get to international waters, something like that? Um, so anyway, long line fishing, still the same, um, but, um, if we look here, um, have y'all bought tuna, have we talked about dolphin safe tuna? Did you ever notice that was, that's the thing. And so, um, we like dolphins because they're cute and we can like see them at SeaWorld. So, yeah, who really cares if like, I don't know, a swordfish is called as bycatch? Not really many people care, but people care about dolphins because uh, they're cute and they, they're like us. Um, so, anyway, what ended up happening here, this was dolphin bycatch. And dolphin bycatch was really common with tuna fishing. Um, and they would get caught in the net, like they would try to catch a school of tuna, and the dolphin would get caught in the net and it would suffocate, you know. And so <clears throat> there's dolphin safe nets. And so here is the Marine Mammal Protection Act. <clears throat> the Marine Mammal Protection Act was the reason why, you know, dolphin safe tuna became a thing. Um, and so if we look here, we can see that um, all the dolphins, these are um, all the dolphins, Northeastern offshore spotted dolphins and then eastern spinner dolphins. And you can see after the, the passage of the, um, the Marine Mammal Protection Act, um, the bycatch or the unintentional catching of dolphins was decreased. And so here, um, dolphin safe tuna uh, kind of helped to spur that on even more. Um, so, but that, none of that was, it got started with the Marine Mammal Protection Act. Yes, sir. Is that also what stopped the overfishing of sharks? So, marine sharks aren't mammals. Well, uh, no. Well, what stopped, what stopped the overfishing? Because um, I know that used to be a pretty big problem. 
it depends on if they're endangered and if you're in national or international waters. Like as far as I don't, as far as I'm concerned, uh, that would be something under the Endangered Species Act. But it would have to be in national waters. Um, there are some treaties, but I don't know that there are any that specifically deal with sharks. I know there's some that deal with whales. Um, so anyway, saw a, an article about Japan killing like 150 whales off the coast of Antarctica for scientific reasons. They like to eat whale meat on their sushi. That's their science for reasons. Um, that's really shady and interesting. Oh, y'all saw that when we watched that movie. Yeah. Okay. Good. I'm glad I, I did. I'm glad I did that movie. So, anyway, um, 1972 Marine Mammal Protection Act um, forced fleets to try to free dolphins. By crutch, dropped dolphin safe tuna. Also helped. Um, other species like the sharks are still being caught. Um, <laughs> so, anyway, there's the bycatch. Yay. Um, a lack of recovery. That's so sad. They're not recovering. Well, it helped though with the bycatch though. Um, I already kind of talked about this. Of course I did because I always do that. Um, but what I was saying earlier was the bottom trawling is going to destroy that <clears throat> benthic environment. So if you have any coral or anything like that, it's going to get crushed and killed. Um, oh, here it is. The average spot on the seafloor of Georgia's banks had been trawled three times and so that um, destroyed, destroying young caught us bycatch, and so um, there's no habitat, no protection, nothing left. Kind of sad. And so here is, um, I don't know if that's a cod or a flounder, but it's a benthic fish. It's flat. Like all those bottom living fish are very flat like that, and so they can burrow under the sediment and hide. That's how that works. Um, anyway, so, and there's your nice little reef, and this is what it looks like after the trawling. So you can see that just nothing left, right? So they don't have a, a shot at really rebounding, not in a quick time. Um, so industrialized fishing, when I say industrialized fishing, that's with technology. Like, technology makes our problems worse, typically, when we're talking about environment. Um, we, we had better fish finders, and people are now... For, have you ever watched any of those tuna fishing shows? Yeah, like you can get like $30,000 for a tuna fish. That is crazy. So they use like helicopters to go find them and stuff. They use helicopters to like spot where the schools of fish are. I mean, that's really like reaching into the bottom of the barrel, right? But then they go sell them. Now I saw one where they were like down by, um, they were down in the Indian Ocean. I'm talking about like pretty far, um, kind of north of Australia. But um, they actually found a school of uh, bluefin tuna, which are very expensive, and they, like, put a net around the whole school, and then they drug the net with the fish swimming all the way to Japan. And then they, the, all the fish in the net were, like, six or seven million dollars. It was crazy. So, yeah, it's very lucrative, but then, you know, that lasts forever. You know, we're going to run out if we keep doing that kind of stuff. But they used, they used the helicopters to find the school, and they had, like, three or four boats, and they just pulled them all the way over. I was like, this is crazy. So, anyway, um, here with industrialized fishing practices, you know, pretty steady um, for catching cod. And then when they, the advent, which is the beginning of, like, advent calendar at Christmas is the beginning of Christmas. Advent means, okay. So, anyway, uh, the advent of industrial trawling, you see the catch really skyrocketed for a while, but then it plummeted after uh, the trawling had happened. So, um, it helped, but now you can see, Here's the cod harvested. I mean, it helped for a while, but then we haven't, there's no, not been much recovery. It's going to take a really long time for that to happen. So, anyway, um, that's pretty straightforward. We're fishing down the food chain. Let me show you what fishing down the food chain looks like. I feel like I have a quote. I don't have a picture. I'll draw you a picture. It's very important. Um, so, fishing down the food chain. You ready to draw a picture of fishing down the food chain? It'll be fun. How, how, what color fish are you on? Blue fish? Yeah. Blue fish. Okay, so we started catching the really large, really desirable fish. What's that? Oops. Okay, well, I'll do better on the next one. Does it go like, no, I'm still doing it wrong. How do you draw? Mm -hmm. This point goes with the triangle. Yes, with the triangle. Yay! Yeah. So we caught all the really. <laughs> Um, so we would catch all the really large, desirable species of fish. So like my Atlanta cod, like that was really large and desirable and, and profitable. Um, and so after we started catching those, we those got depleted. So we started catching a little bit smaller fish. That's good. 
And then we caught all those and they were overexploited. And so now we're having to catch smaller fish. And now we're like, I went to, I don't know where I went the other day. Oh, my mom came up and she wanted to go to Aldi. And they had, Aldi has like crazy fish from China. That's why it's three down downtown. No, it's not worth it. It's still hungry. Okay, so, um, but anyway, they had this um, kind of fillet. It was like S-W-A-I, like swai fish. And I'm like, what is that? And when I saw that, and it was beside salmon, which was kind of like the middle kind, and then your stuff like your king mackerel, really nice big fish, that doesn't even, you can't go buy that. But anyway, um, I was like, that's fishing down the food chain. So we've caught all these desirable species. We don't have anything left. So now we're like, tilapia is nasty. Like, they're that is like the bottom of, they'll eat anything, nasty carp kind of stuff. But we're selling that now. But before, that was not, that was not even a thing. And so um, all of our really great fish are gone. And so we keep going down the food chain to these smaller fish, different kinds of fish, because these are gone. These are gone. These are gone. It's gone. And now we're like over here somewhere. That's fishing down the food chain. So the large predatory fish are gone. So we're going down trophic levels, and that's what we're selling. So that's, that's my best picture of that. Sorry. Oh, yeah, this is funny. Um, like, Orange Ruffy was once called Slimehead. So I've actually seen Orange Ruffy on the menu, and I was like, oh, that sounds good. I didn't know it was called Slimehead. But um, what I was saying was, you know, fishing's going to increase. Because when you go fishing, you like to catch big fish. I mean, tell me what I'm, like, blowing your mind here. Um, all the big fish get caught, and what's left over are the younger fish. And when you catch younger fish, then they don't have to reproduce. And then, you know, you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot. So anyway, um, we're eating and catching fish at lower trophic levels. And as we catch and eat fish at the lower trophic levels, we're, you know, kind of, we're taking out the base of the food chain. Anyway, sustainable choices. Basically, if you do want to eat some fish, I think it's important for you to know this because AP Environmental Science is great and everything, but you need to know what you can eat. U.S. farm catfish is pretty good. Farm clams, farm shrimp's good. Um, crab and stuff from Alaska, like that stuff is heavily regulated. That's why it's so expensive, but it's okay to eat it. Um, Pacific halibut, oysters, farm, any kind of crustacean, you know what I'm talking about with a crustacean with a shell, if that's, you can eat that if it's been farmed because it's so small, any kind of toxic stuff would be bioaccumulated. Um, farm scalps, farm shrimp, tilapia, U.S. farm. Be careful that it's U.S. farm. Tilapia is getting farmed in Europe, uh, not Europe, in Asia, and it's in China. It's a big deal, and there's no regulations, and it's so scary to me. Uh, farm trout's okay. Um, let's talk about what not to eat. Caviar, you don't want to eat caviar because those are little fish babies. They didn't get to make it. Follow me. All right. Um, Chilean sea bass, these are really overfished. Anything from the Atlantic is, is you know, dolphin fish. Mahi Mahi is so good though. Have y'all had Mahi Mahi before? Okay, it's over over fish. Um, orange ruby. <laughs> salmon. Salmon farm in the Atlantic. They're putting pins in the Atlantic and what they do, they have a net. Okay, like this is uh, like let's pretend like this is a salmon net. And then everything outside of this room would be the Atlantic Ocean. And there's like a net around us and we're little fishies. And so we're in here, we're pooping and making yuckies. And um, all that stuff is causing eutrophication in the water around us because we're just in a net, okay? And they're giving us back antibiotics because we're all like squished up here together. And we're eating like corn and chicken poop. That's the thing. It's called chicken litter, but they feed it to them. I'm not kidding. So that's uh, called, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so don't, if you go to like Chili's and you get like some salmon, that's what you're getting, okay? Um, make sure it's, um, you want wild caught. Um, but anyway, or just not a land farm. That's, that's a big thing there. Um, but that's causing eutrophication. If one of us gets out, we're like way bigger than those little chunks in the hallway, you know. Um, so we're going to outcompete the ones that are outside. And uh, they actually have to uh, feed the salmon red food dye because they're not rich in the omega-3 acids that make fish red. They don't have that because they're not eating. Uh, they're not eating the smaller fish. So it's all fake and gross. Sorry, don't eat a, a lint salmon. Um, so any kind of anything that was farmed in Asia, no, no. So like I said, I saw most of the fish at Aldi was from China. That's show shape. Um, what? Aldi is a 
Ollie's a grocery store. Ollie's a grocery store. And they and honestly, they're doing better as far as selling organic stuff. And they're doing, I mean, they have some good options. They're kind of cheap, you know, as far as like you being able to go there and get stuff for good. Um, and so they have like organic strawberries for cheap. But you got to be careful about where you get your seafood from. Yes, sir. There's this one um, farmer's market I went to in Roswell this one time. And like literally they would just have these big tanks and they would catch the fish out of the tanks. And, like, Great. Fresh. Uh, Connor, what did you say? Um, right on the little footnote, little star thing, it said, worry about, like, um, mercury. Yes. Um, is that accurate with salmon and stuff? These larger tuna, like bluefin tuna, swordfish, these are all high on the trophic level. Uh, and so, um, your smaller fish, um, like a salmon, for example, that's a pretty small fish. And this is in your book, so you can look at it there. Yeah, because it's really expensive in Japan for sushi. Yeah, it's apparently tasty, but I'm not. And I'm not saying it's good or sustainable or healthy. I'm saying it's expensive. Yes. Where would scallops fall? Scallops have. Have you ever? Base scallops, right there. Where? Oh, do you know what a scallop is, though? Uh, it's kind of like a mussel clam type. Yeah. Have you ever seen like this? Thing? Real pretty, like. It looks like a shrimp when it's cut. Yeah, those things. That's what they That's a scallop. No, a scallop looks like a big, pretty circle. I like scallops. I don't talk bad about scallops. Um, that's my jam. I'm going to go eat some scallops now. Um, I like them. Uh, marine protected areas and marine reserves. These are, I mean, y'all know what the word reserve and preserve means now. These are areas where fishing is limited or there's no fishing. And the whole idea is, you probably want to highlight that. I feel like it's on test. Um. <laughs> um, there are areas where, you know, like I said, it's either little or no fishing or no fishing at all. Um, and that's the difference. A protected area has fishing, but it's, you know, limited. Uh, a reserve, anytime you see the word reserve or preserve, you ain't touching it. That's what those words mean. Um, so, anyway, a lot of people that are commercially fishing, they don't want to close off part of the ocean to fishing. That makes you mad because you're going to lose money. But what these end up doing is kind of cool. They end up seeding the seed. Seeding the seas, sorry. Um, so here's how to seed the seas. Let me, like, blow this up a little bit. And so if you want, what do you do? If you make a reserve in this area right here, you no fishing. And so um, there's fish in there. But the fish, I mean, there's, it's not, like, blocked off. So they can swim out. So if you have a really small reserve, you're not going to protect a whole lot. If you have a really big reserve, then they're going to swim around, but they're not going to swim outside and seed the seas, which means they're going to swim out and populate the area. So you want a kind of a medium-sized reserve so that you're protecting the population, but still the fishermen outside this area can profit and the, the rest of the ocean will be able to um, have an increased population. So that's the idea of seeding the seas and, and how to design a reserve. Hey, we did it. Um, downwelling. Downwelling is, here I'll pick some of y'all. I'm tired of talking. Um, downwelling is, which one, Ryan? C. When oxygen, yeah, perfect. So um, the surface water is going to be rich in oxygen, so it's going to sink down. Um, let's see, the next one. An area on the ocean that contains habitat on the ocean floor is called what, Jonathan? Yeah, benthic is bottom. That's easy to remember. Um, when y'all watch the PowerPoint for your test, I explain in a beautiful story, it's actually hilarious and slightly inappropriate, um, about how to remember like littoral, limnetic, photic, and all that. Because I know you don't know those words, but I know that they're on your test. That picture, do y'all know that picture in your book I'm talking about where it has like a duck in the lake and then there's all like 15 words? You're like, what? So make sure you watch that. But benthic is in there, and benthic's in a lake too. An area that occurs along coast at temperate latitudes, and temperate is the operational term there. That's where we live. Taylor, what you got? Which one? B. Okay, a mangrove swamp is actually going to be in tropical areas. So temperate is kind of where we live. If we go to Savannah, we see a salt marsh, and so that's C. Well, it was one of those two, so good guess. Um, a mass of calcium carbonate composed of skeletons of tiny animals. I have no idea what calcium carbonate is. I have never heard of that. Grant. Yay, you went. Um, which statement about coral bleaching is true? Saw an article, and I actually retweeted it. I think it was this morning, about coral bleaching in the Great Barrier Reef. And that's, like, heartbreaking because that, do you know how many millions of, I wouldn't even, 
go of past saying close to, well, I don't want to say billions, that's a lot, but how much money comes into Australia because ecotourism for the Great Barrier Reef. They can't do, you can't do nothing about that. Like, you cannot change the pH of the ocean. I wonder if they could, like, get some buffer out there. Maybe. I don't know. But that, that would be an interesting, like, chemistry thing. But there's widespread bleaching starting to happen in the um, Great Barrier Reef, which is kind of sad because I wanted to go there. Maybe by the time I get there, it'll be all white and dead. Ashlyn? Which one? Yeah, so the zooxanthellae, which is the photosynthetic algae that work in that symbiotic relationship with the coral animal, they leave and they have the color so it turns white. Which of the following does not mask the decline of fisheries? Um, let's see. Carrie? <laughs> well, do you think, okay, I had talked about how the fishing catch stayed the same and they were having to do more work. Do you remember that? Well, they're definitely having to travel longer distances. They're probably spending more time out there fishing. They have more sophisticated methods of fishing and fleets fish in shallow waters near the coast. Which one of those really don't fit in? Yeah, so we're not being able to stay in shallow water and like fish for, you know, right here. No, so D. Um, Marine reserves have all the following benefits, except, um, do to do, oh, that's the wrong color. Alex. Alex. E. Yeah, so the size of the fish is going to increase in a reserve, so, right. Um, what does this graph show about the future of global fisheries catch? Uh, Chelsea? Yeah, so it's unlikely that's going to increase because we're already kind of putting it all out there. Um, so what conclusion can you draw from this graph about commercial catches of Atlantic cod? And I kind of had talked about this. Here's here's trawling and then it plummeted. Um, and so now it's all closed. Abby, what did you say? Well, after the industrial trawl, and that's where they're dragging the nets along the bottom, after that, it definitely um, caused the fishery to crash. So probably just A. Um, whether or not it'll come back, I don't know. So how do you feel about that? Okay, take a little break. I'm going to show you a couple minutes of, um, have, who's seen the movie E.T.? Let's just pretend like you never saw, you never seen E.T. So I'm going to show you a couple minutes of that. Does that sound nice? Take a little break. Before I leave today, I'm going to update Blackboard so that it has do this, do this, do this for your test. I'll make sure I'll link in.